have a delivery for Clark W. Griezmann. Merry Christmas. Merry Christmas. I can't believe it. What is it? My bonus. <laughs> Open it, Clarky. Open it. Wrong. Honey, <laughs> it's bigger than you expected. <laughs> Smaller? <laughs> what is it? It's a, it's a one year membership in the Jelly of the Month Club. <laughs> oh, God. Clark, that's the gift that keeps on giving the whole year. That's right. That it is, Edward. Well, what's up, everybody? We are kicking off a brand new series today called The Christmas Miracle. And so we're going to be talking about how some things meet our expectations, and then there are some things that fall a little bit short of our expectations, as you just saw there on a little Christmas vacation. Good old Eddie, right? How many of you, don't raise your hand, have a cousin Eddie in the family? Don't raise your hand. <laughs> just think about that. Think about that. All right. Well, I want to welcome everybody that's watching online. Uh, we, we love our uh, soldiers and our servicemen and women that serve our country. And we know many of them are overseas doing what you do. And so thanks for tuning in and watching. We, we think that's incredible. Uh, and then I also know this, that almost every week or, or seems like every week that there's a, a family that we love about to head on to the next assignment, the next thing. And, uh, and there's families coming and going. That's the beauty of Manhattan. And uh, we, we like to say we're preaching to the parade. And we, we don't take that uh, for granted. What an opportunity for us. And so we, we love you families here that some of you are, are on your last Sunday. And, and uh, we love you. And anybody else that's watching, we, we do that just because we know people are traveling on vacation, sometimes sick, hopefully not. And then people all over watching. And, and so thanks for tuning in to do that. And then as we kick this off, week one of Christmas Miracle, you beautiful specimens are physically in the room. So uh, that's just exciting. So thanks for being here. And uh, I, I think if, if this is your first time that you've come to check out Rock Hills Church, I, I think you picked a good opportunity to be here, a good time to be here. At least I hope so, uh, because I think what we're going to talk about today can bring some practical help and hope to your life. That's always our goal every Sunday. But uh, we're, we're glad that you're brave enough to come to a new place and to check it out. That's a big deal, uh, probably to you, but it's a big deal to us as well. So thanks for being here. I'm excited to, to talk about this series as we are in the Christmas season. I, I think like at 3 p.m. on Thanksgiving, um, Christmas is on. You know what I mean? I'm like, uh, for me, I'm like, no, it's not. No, it's not. I'm, I'm, I'm going to hold out for a while. Anybody, hold outers out there? Anybody like hold out? Yes, the th three or four humbug people like me are out there, Scrooges. Uh, and then everybody else, you're like, it started before Thanksgiving. Is that you? Before, you're like, Christmas music is October too soon, you know? Like some of you know it's not. And so Christmas season is here, whether we like it or not. Good old stores like Walmart remind us uh, years before the holiday that the holiday's coming. So they, they always have the next one right around the corner, and, uh, and we're in it. And so one of the things that I don't know in your family setting, if you grew up, in fact, I'll ask this question. How many of you grew up as kind of celebrating or focusing on Advent? That's kind of something you grew up around. Yeah, yeah, so, so about half of you. Um, we didn't really focus or say Advent growing up, but, but now that I look back as an adult, we actually celebrated quite a bit of it, just didn't realize it. And uh, Advent uh, it, it is more than just a, a calendar. But I'll tell you what, for my girls, <laughs> they love their little Advent calendar, right? You get to count down the days because if you notice right here, it says, you see what that says? That's good. It's good that 10 of us can, can read in here today, so that's awesome. Let's try that again. So can you, everybody? Milk yeah, so little, my littlest one, Jay, who's five, literally, first thing, got up, came down the stairs this morning, came and stared at me with her half-open eyes and said, can I have my chocolate thing, you know? So, so she, she was definitely looking forward to her. So to her, Advent is the chocolate. And, uh, and, and both girls do this all the time. They say, hey, Siri. Actually, I probably shouldn't say that very loud because I'll mess up my iPad. But uh, they'll say, hey, Siri, how many days until Christmas? And, and the whole thought of Advent today is we talk about 
really the miracle of Christmas. And today we're going to focus on the miracle of peace. And, and without raising your hands, I, I think a question I could ask everybody is, how many of you would like to have a miracle of peace in their life? And uh, so as we talk about Advent, whether you grew up around it or not, for the simplicity of this series, here's what Advent really means. Uh, it means to wait, to watch, and to hope. It means to wait, to watch, and to hope. That's going to be very important for all of us today. Advent means to wait with great anticipation and great expectation, and watch, and to hope. And Advent is more than just pieces of chocolate <laughs> that we're going to look at in, in this series today, and, and, and specifically talk about just the miracle of peace. But I got to be honest with you, I'm not always a very good waiter. I just came from Disney World this past week, and one of the greatest we reasons was to see my girls' faces smile. The second was to go to somewhere warm. And uh, so we get there, and the high was 60, but it was still nice compared to 25 when we left. And, uh, and so, but the thing about Disney is I realized, knowing that I was going to talk about this message, it just reinforced that I'm not a very good waiter. I do complicated algorithms in my head to figure out, well, that's not true, but let's just, let's just say that it is. But I try to figure out which is the shortest line. Which one's going to take me the least amount of time and cause me to wait the least? Anybody like me in here? When you, when you get to the toll, for those of us that still haven't got our Kansas toll tags, and you get to the lines and you see eight of them, how many of you are like, which one's the fastest? How, who, how can I get in front of that person that keeps passing me that don't know what cruise is? You know, maybe that's just me. Or when I go to McDonald's, and nobody raise your hand because you don't go to McDonald's, right? But, but, uh, but yes, you do. So you pull up, right? There's two lines to McDonald's, and you're like, which one's the quickest? Yeah, I know you're not as spiritual as you think you are. All right, so which one's okay? When I go to Dylan's in the grocery line, I'm like looking, I'm like, which one is the quick? Who's fastest? I'm looking at which, which person at the checkout desk isn't talking, isn't asking any questions, the one that's just scanning, that's focused, that's intent. Now, that's the one that I want to go to because I'll tell you, I'm not the best waiter. I'm not the best waiter. So a great question for all of us as we talk about this series today is, are you good at waiting? How are you at waiting? Are you a good waiter? Now, when I was growing up, you know, the whole present thing under the tree, right? So my parents would, would not just do that the, the night before. They, they would do that sometimes days and weeks before. So you got that fun experience of passing the tree as a little kid all the time, looking at that present and thinking like, what's in there, right? It's kind of like a hungry dog looking at a steak. You're like, what's in there? So my brother and I, we, my middle brother, and I want to get this correct so I don't blame my oldest brother. Uh, but my middle brother, Matt, and I, we, we decided that we were tired of waiting. And um, we weren't good waiters. But we were very uh, meticulous. And, uh, and so one, one afternoon, I think, I can't remember, it was, I don't think we got up at night because the parents were there. I think they were gone for the afternoon. And we decided that we we're going to look at uh, the gifts with Troy and Matt on them. And we pulled those out. And we literally got a razor blade from the from the exacto knife, you know, we got a razor blade, and we only opened one in, and we literally meticulously cut the tape with one small little stroke and unfolded the end of the package, pulled it out, didn't make any more wrinkles, and we looked at what we had because we weren't good waiters. And then we placed it back in. We folded it all back up. We put one stick of tape over the one little slice that I cut. You would have had to really inspect it to, to see it. And, and, and both of us put all of our gifts back. We knew what they were. And then we memorized how they were set under the tree. We put them all back. So the time came for good old Christmas morning, right? We all get up, and, uh, and this year, you know what, what I learned at least, I, I think my, my brother Matt would say the same thing, is it was kind of a downer, because I already knew what I was getting. I took out, the, there's some good in the not knowing, you know? And so we had to open the gifts, we had to fake it to make it. And we're like, no way! You know, and my brother looked at me like, you know? So, so we knew for days what we had, and, and, uh, and I say that to say this, that I'm not always a good waiter, but as we talk about this Christmas season, are you a good waiter? How are you waiting? Because uh, there's some good in not knowing. And most importantly, what we're going to look at in the Christmas miracle is, is really this thought, is that there's good, there's good in the waiting. But we, we don't have to be without knowing. And the Christmas story is us really knowing what's already come, but sometimes still hoping for what we hope will come, but it's already here. And that's in the presence of Christ. And, and, and so, um, especially for the history of Israel, when it, when it came to waiting, they were waiting for what seemed like forever. 
You know, if, if waiting for them in the Advent life, the waiting, the watching, the anticipation, uh, was way more than waiting for chocolate. <laughs> Uh, waiting for them what was an ongoing thing of hundreds of years. For, for, for many of those hundreds of years, they were slaves. And it seemed like forever for the time that they were waiting and waiting and waiting. Now, now I, I like to fish. And so for some of you that, that don't like to fish, this will be a short illustration. So hang with me, all right? Uh, but, but I like to fish. And my friend Jared and I, we go fishing from time to time. We say this a lot, that we do a lot more fishing than catching because that's typically the case. Uh, but when we have a few moments, as I think back, a handful on one hand moments of actually catching, uh, one of those moments, we, we used a, a bobber. I got a picture of it, but you know what a bobber is, you know? And uh, so when, when fish aren't biting, the bobber is kind of boring. But when the fish are biting, the bobber is very exciting because you with great anticipation and expectation are watching that bobber to bob. And as soon as that bobber bobs and goes under, I'm about to rip the lips off of that sucker. I'm so excited. And in my mind, I'm playing out role playing that there's great hope that this is the big bohema, right? And so I'm watching that bobber. And we went on one time and I remember every time our bobber touched the water, it began to bob. And how much fun it was to anticipate to watch that bobber bobbing. So even if you don't like fishing, as we talk about waiting in the Advent kind of life, we're talking about what does it look like when we wait with great expectation? How are we at waiting? When we do wait, are we focused with expectation and anticipation? While we wait, are we watching? While we're watching, are we hope-filled? And that's really the story of Christmas. I mean, one of the most amazing things about Christmas is this whole thought of the Christmas story is about waiting and watching and hoping. And for Israel, it had been prophesied for hundreds of years that God would send a fancy word in the Jewish realm, a Messiah, which meant God sent one, God's son, a savior. And for hundreds of years, they were watching and waiting. Some were hopeful and some have given up. And some had waited too long and they were no longer good waiters. And they were like, I'm tired of waiting. And yeah, 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 we've heard that before, but it ain't coming true in my life and I'm done waiting. So how are we at waiting? And today we're going to talk about the Christmas miracle of peace. Christmas miracle of peace. Christmas reminds us of Advent. The Christmas season is really something that has been commercialized and that is kind of man-made. But the point of the season that we're in is not man-made. I don't believe it's, it's miraculous that God made. And it was the moment that he sent his Savior. When the, the Savior arrived on this planet is really the Christmas story. And part of that story is the arrival of peace. It brings peace to our settings, peace to our situations. And if we're just transparent today without having to show your life on a screen or go public or stand up here, but just in the private of your own seat, I think some of us come in here today in need of peace. Because some of us are tired of waiting. And some of us, we've kind of given up on what we're waiting for. And it's no longer hope that we're looking at the bobber. We're like, nothing's ever going to bite. And today, man, the goal for you would be that God would give you some of that, that peace. One of the most beautiful pictures painted of an Advent setting, a season of looking forward to the arrival of Jesus, that's really Advent, watching, waiting, anticipating what God would do. One of the greatest illustrations of that is in the, in the life of a guy named John the Baptist. Now, he was a part of the Christmas story. If you go read, and I encourage you to do so in this fun season, go read about the Christmas story. You're going to find that John the Baptist is in it. Now, you think John the Baptist, that must have, he must have been named for his denominational affiliation. No, that's not the case. He, he was nicknamed that because of what he did. But John the Baptist was, a, was, even in the Christmas story, the one that paved the way. He was the first step of the story of what was to come after him. And that was no different after they grew up. He was Jesus' cousin. And, and so before Jesus' ministry went public, he was kind of obscure. People didn't publicly know about Jesus until he began his ministry around 30-ish years of age. But John the Baptist, one of the most beautiful stories in Scripture, is that John the Baptist, Jesus' cousin, knew he had a role to play. And his role is really a picture of Advent. He said this of himself, I am a voice in the wilderness. You know, part of the, what the wilderness meant in that culture was there was no way. It's a wilderness. And he said, I'm a voice in the wilderness where there seems to be no way. He came to say, hey, when you wait and when you watch, you better do it with expectation and anticipation because God's about to do something awesome. And what's awesome is John the Baptist was an advent. 
And what he did by his lifestyle was make a way where there seemed to be no way. And he made rough ways smooth so that people's hearts would be more aware and open and waiting for the coming of Jesus' presence. What a job role. Jesus says of his own cousins that there's no greater man born of woman than John the Baptist because he had a role and he was a voice in the wilderness that, that made the rough ways smooth. Rock Hills Church, do you know why we exist as a church? Do you know it's not just to get together on a Sunday to gather and coagulate together? In fact, I say this all the time. What we do when we scatter is just as important, if not more important than what we do when we gather. We exist. You know what we do in our existence? We exist to go before Jesus. Now, he could do it without us, but he's chosen to partner with us. We go before Jesus to make some rough ways smooth and to give easier access in the hearts of people to Jesus. One of the reasons that we do some of the things that we've done just in the past month and a half that I love. And in fact, I want to let you know that you've invested $7,000, estimated $7,000, to make it possible to feed 50 families that were low-income families from the Boys and Girls Club, and not just there, but other places in around Manhattan. You guys made sure that they had a Thanksgiving dinner and a $50 gift card just to show them that, hey, we're offering you practical, practical help so that Jesus hopefully can bring some eternal hope. And that's what we do as a church to be, be Advent. There's a lot of rough ways in our area. <laughs> There's a lot of rough roads. There's people that are tired of waiting for hope and joy and peace. And what we get an opportunity to do is to go before and make the way a little bit smoother so that hearts are more, more open to the eternal hope of peace that Jesus brings. What an opportunity. What an opportunity that we have to get together. And this is just a little bit of a scratch in the service on the greater need of our soldiers and our servicemen and women in this area. I kind of thought I knew what it was like, but now that I live here, I'm way involved now of knowing what it's truly like for those families. And we had an opportunity to do OGG, Operation Gobble Gobble, right? And, uh, and we got families together, over 100 adults, uh, not only had a dinner, uh, but they had a time without their kids for about two hours, right? And uh, so there were 70 kids that we took care of, and they ate their own food and were loved on. And, and while parents got to have adult conversations, and I think it was fun, you can ask them, but they had a good time. I saw a husband, wife, uh, and a husband. Um, uh, that doesn't really make any sense, but I saw a husband and a wife um, that just looked at each other and were smiling, and I thought that's kind of sweet. We heard later that, that they hadn't really had an opportunity to do that because their lives are so chaotic, just to be together and laugh again together. I, I think that's supernatural. I think that's miraculous to bring a little peace and chaos. You guys provided that, made that happen. Right now, we're, we're focused on some women and some families in the homestead. Those have been, been rescued from sex trafficking that I heard when I went to a banquet last year that some of those women will, will, will do 30 to 40 tricks in a day. And they're devalued, and that's happening right here in our own area. And you know what we get a chance to do for a rough way? To make it a little smoother. That's Advent. We have a chance as a church to bring some waiting, some anticipation and expectation of hope by giving practical help so that Jesus can come along and bring eternal hope. We have that opportunity as individuals to live an Advent kind of life. And uh, what, what an amazing opportunity uh, for a church. And so, so what I want to do today is uh, look at a passage in Luke chapter 2. And, and you know what? You don't even have to be familiar with church to be religious. All you have to do is be familiar with Charlie Brown movie <laughs> to, to know this passage, all right? And if you don't, that's totally cool. But, but I want to read you today just a little bit about the miracle of waiting, anticipating for a great arrival. What does it mean for the arrival of Jesus in my life? Luke chapter 2 says, And there were shepherds living out in the fields nearby, keeping watch. I, I want you to picture, you ever seen a neon sign or, or just go outside and look at our neon lights on the front of the theater, right? So I want you to focus on, have you ever seen neon lights just like, eh, eh, okay? With some of these words, I want you to think about that in your mind so that they jump out. Keeping watch. And there were shepherds living out in the fields, keeping watch over their flocks at night. An angel of the Lord appeared to them, and the glory of the Lord shone around them. And they were terrified, or in Charlie Brown, they were sore afraid. <laughs> but the angel said to them, do not be afraid. I bring you, this is huge, good news. 
If there's going to be dramatic fashion, if this story is true, and I believe that it is, if angels are going to crash the scene on some shepherds some night, do you think what they have to say is probably pretty important? And they say, here's the good news that will cause great joy for all people. What is it? Tell me, angel. (laughs) Today in the town of David, a Savior has been born to you. He is the Messiah, the sent one, God's son, the Lord. This will be a sign to you. You will find a baby wrapped in claws and lying in a manger. And then suddenly a great company of heavenly hosts appeared with the angel, praising God and saying, glory to God in the highest heaven. You know what was going on in heaven in that morning, that moment? Glory to God in the highest of heavens. What was happening on earth? Check this out. And on earth, peace to those whom God's favor rests. And when I hear that, I'm like, I'll take a little God's favor. Mm -hmm. Bring it on. But did you know that God's favor doesn't always mean God's favors? You look at the original Christmas story cast, and for some of them, it would look like God was doing them no favors, but yet they were highly favored by God. They had to wait and anticipate for an arrival of God's great promise. Now, I don't know what what you are like, um, you know, at night. Uh, but I'm just picturing the angels. And we, and we hear stories like this, and we're like, oh, they were keeping watch over the sheep. And, and uh, why were they keeping watch? You ever think about that? Do you think it was because the, the sheep were, were such a high value of price that in the middle of the night, somebody's going to steal them and sell them on eBay? Uh, no. Uh, do you think the sheep were, it was so ironic that um, they, were, they were a popular mascot for a college, and so you know, some, some college students prayed a prank and stole the sheep at night to masquerade their, their mascot around? No, this is how I think. I'm very strange. Uh, why, why would they keep watch over the sheep? Many of you know this already. Because a popular statement in that culture that we get even to this day is, is you ever heard a, a, a wolf in sheep's clothing? They're watching because of predators. Can you imagine the, the low-grade angst as you're watching for a wolf to not steal your sheep and all you got is a staff? So it's not like a serene, quaint environment. Oh, they're not kicked back with their feet up like we're just chilling watching the sheep. No, they were probably leaning in. They were probably watching with great anticipation for predators that they didn't take out their sheep. And in that setting, all of a sudden, an angel appears. And it's not like little precious moments. They're like, oh. No, they're, all, they're already on edge. And can you imagine already being on edge and all of a sudden an angel appears? That's why every time an angel appears, they're like, sorry, sorry, don't be afraid. It's us. You know, they, they always freak people out. Lacey, when we first got married, I I realized something that I didn't realize before. There's a reason for that, because we hadn't slept together at that point. So we were sleeping together as we were married, and here's what I learned, uh, is that sometimes she wakes up in the middle of the night freaked out. Now, she's not really awake. She's just kind of doing something strange. And so it's a little bit like this. So I'm picture this. I'm out, you know. And all of a sudden, it's (gasps) raises up on the end of the bed, grabs my arm with the pressure of a crocodile on my arm, and she's staring at and pointing at the end of the bed. <gasps> and I'm, I'm like half awake. I still my bed trip over the laundry basket. And I'm like, you know, like, what, what's going on? And she's like, oh, it's nothing. And right back to sleep. And I'm up for the next hour, like, <gasps> like freaking out. So now we've been married a while. So now what I do is she does, <gasps> still does it sometimes in points. And I don't even open my eyes. I just put her back down. I'm like, yeah, it's all right. I don't care if somebody's there. Just lay down. Just lay down. That's kind of what I picture what's going on in this setting. Kind of have, you kind of have the angels already anticipating for predators to take out their sheep, and then an angel appears. That's why they say, don't be afraid. So it's a very dramatic scene. And why would all this drama take place if not for very dramatic news? We've got good news. Now here's a lot of when we start Christmas series, and I know it's just the season we should live this way all the time. Making an impact is not just an event like some of the events I talked about. It's a lifestyle, but the events are a catalyst to help us live the kind of life where we should be living all the time. But here's where many of us go this direction, I believe, from what God wants for this season of Advent and where we go for this season. Many of the people that got this good news, it was a letdown. It was, whoa, whoa, whoa. I thought you were going to reconcile our nation and put us back on top. I thought you were going to give us favors because I'm special. And the angel says, you know what's going on in heaven? A party. You know why? Because there's peace that has come to earth. And the good news is God has sent you your greatest need, a Savior. Now, that's monumental. 
And if you're just exploring or checking out Christianity today, I got to let you know th this is where the rubber meets the road. Now, it's between you and the Holy Spirit. I can't rush or push or manipulate you in a journey. If I can talk you into something, somebody can talk you out of it. But as you process, do I want to follow Jesus Christ? I got to know in my mind that the greatest need of the story of Christmas is that he brought peace to our presence because he knew our greatest need. And the good news is that we need a Savior. And so as we apply this today, it's really, really simple uh, in, in three points. And, and I wanted to share what they are. The arrival of Jesus, he brings peace to some specific areas if we let him. With the arrival of Jesus in a Christmas season, as we look forward with great anticipation, he brings some very specific uh, solutions to our very specific needs. One of those is the arrival of Jesus brings peace to my soul. Brings peace to my soul. Question. How's your soul? Have you made peace with God personal? Because there's more of just celebrating the Christmas season. And some of us are like, oh. Some of us are like, wee. <laughs> but whatever we think of it, it's more than just celebrating. Have we experienced the arrival of God's solution? Some people bring a guest and they say, dude, I hope you don't talk about sin. Because there's a problem we all have. It's called sin. They say, I hope you don't talk about sin when I bring a guest because I don't want you to offend them. And, and, and I think, well, I got newsflash for you. The pastor's a sinner, which makes the person that brought somebody, that if you're with them today, they're a sinner too. And you're like, <laughs> cool. And you're a sinner also. And I don't get uncomfortable, awkward talking about sin. I don't want to drill down and focus or make you feel guilty. And that's my goal. That's not my goal. But we're all sinners. Hello, welcome to humanity. You can call it mistake. You can call it what you want. But there are things that I want to hit in my own standards that I make up that I don't hit, let alone God's standards. And when I don't meet God's standards, what do I do? That's called sin. And it's not me missing the mark morally. That's a byproduct of sin. But sin is me not living in response to what God's best is for my life. I fall short. I'm a sinner. And it's not to focus on sin. It's to focus on the solution. That Jesus sent a Savior. And so when he sends a Savior, there's nothing I can do about it. I can't give enough that despite some faith institutions, you can't give enough money to absolve your sin. You can't do enough things to act morally enough to where, okay, I'm going to stop trying to cuss, drink, and lust. Uh, and because if I just do it a little bit less, maybe I'll fly under the radar. You know what I'm talking about? Sometimes we have this mindset, if I just do it a little less, I won't be as bad as somebody else. And maybe I won't get red flagged for God's audit, right? I'll fly a little under. But, but you know, on your best day, you can never work for it. It's a grace gift that God gives you. And and the story of John the Baptist did follow with Jesus. He did prepare the way, but some of them missed it. But some were waiting with great anticipation. There's some cool stories about the Christmas story that when Jesus were born, there was a lady whose husband had died. And for years and years and years, she waited, dedicated her life to God at the temple for the moment that Jesus was brought. And she sees him and she prophesies over him that God sent the solution. And she's like, now I'm good. I can go because I've seen what God sent. How are we at waiting? Does it bring peace to our soul? You got to know it's not just an ornament or something around it, but it would be in the very depths of who we are because there's animosity between us and God unless there's a solution through faith in Jesus Christ. I want to read you a verse in Romans 5. One says this, Therefore, since we have been justified, which means just as if I never sinned. Ah, talk about peace. I remember the moment I made that decision. I was different when I laid my head on the pillow at night after that. I've been justified just as if I never sinned. And my sin was pretty blatant. We have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. Peace with God. Do you have peace with God? You don't get peace with God through your moral behavior modification. You don't get peace with God from prayers from your grandma. <laughs> You get peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. Brings peace to our soul. Another thought is this. The arrival of Jesus brings peace to our relationships. Because many of us in here have made that decision to say, I want to be at peace in my soul with God. And thank you, God, that your solution was to send a Savior, your son. 
that we look to the cross. The reason that we skip forward in Christmas to Easter, I know I'm going forward a little bit, to focus on when Jesus died and was raised from the dead, is because we need to know the big why behind Christmas. It's because God sent his son to be a savior and to be the perfect sacrifice to die for my sin that brings peace to my soul. Maybe that's your step today, is to receive Jesus through faith and God sent one. But many of us have made that decision, and so that would lead to another application of the arrival of peace, is that it brings peace to my relationships. Now, I'm going to ask you a question that's kind of a vulnerable question. I know you got people sitting next to you, so don't lie in church, okay? Don't don't lie in church. You know, every time you lie in church, an angel doesn't get its wings, all right? So I just made that up. Or a baby unicorn dies or something. So don't don't lie in church, right? And so I I want to just ask you a question. How many of you have ever re-gifted a gift? How many of you have already done that this year? Sick. Sick people. <laughs> now, why, why, why do you re-gift a gift? Hang with me. Why do you re-gift a gift? There's probably many reasons. For you, spiritual crowd, the, the main reason is probably you're like, that is such an amazing gift. I am not worthy. I will give it to somebody else. That's probably you. That's probably you, because right? you're awesome. If you're more like me, it's probably you get something, you're like, I will never use this, so I'm going to give it to somebody else that they'll never use. It's called re-gifting. And then there's other reasons why you're getting ready you're, to go to a Christmas party. We love, we have 14,000 Christmas parties in this season. And so we go to a Christmas party and we're like, hey, was this a whole gift thing? I don't know. Maybe you look it up and you're like, oh, shoot, we're walking out the door. Yes, it is. That's how you wrap up the cat or the crock pot or a kid or whatever. You like just take that thing with you. And then other reasons would be like this. You don't know you're quite there in that kind of relationship. And you're like, you go out to eat and they say, oh, I got, Merry Christmas. I got you something. You're like, uh, yeah, awesome. Oh my gosh, thank you. I'm going to use the bathroom and I got you something too, right? You're like looking for a plant in the restaurant or something. To, you're like, oh, I'm so in trouble. Do you know part of the thought of bringing peace that God sent to us to have peace is to bring peace to our relationships? Your purpose on the planet, if you've experienced that peace in your soul, is to re-gift it, is to redistribute it. That's part of your role as a follower of Christ. If you're a follower of Jesus, that your role on earth is to really re-gift what God has given you and and to have peace in your relationships. There's a verse in Matthew that says, uh, Jesus says, Blessed are the peacemakers, for they will be called children of God. Notice it doesn't say peace breakers. Some of you are peace breakers. You you say, well, how do I know if a peace Do you like conflict? Then you're quite possibly a peace breaker, right? If you're like, I just enjoy that, right? Some of you, I'm not a peace breaker. I'm more of a peacekeeper, peacekeeper. And and for some of us, that means like this year, the Christmas function, I'm not going to say anything that makes everybody mad. I'm just going to keep the peace. I'll just keep it quiet. I'll be a good person. You know, Jesus doesn't call you to be a peacekeeper. He calls you to be a peacemaker. There's a difference. To be a peacemaker means that I'm going to do the best that I can to live the kind of life in response to re-gift God's grace in my life. To make peace. So if there's a dysfunction setting, I'm going to bring function to it just by how I love and response to God's grace to me. You're supposed to be salt to make a difference. I'm supposed to be salt to make a difference. You say, well, that's really hard. Absolutely. That's why every day, you know what? I need the presence of Jesus in my life. I need to remember that he brought peace to my soul because usually I'm more in angst. I'm not always a good waiter. Romans 12, 18 says, if, I love this verse especially for these first few words. If it is possible, because that lets me know, oh, thank goodness there's an out. As far as it depends on you, out number two, live at peace with everyone. Can you imagine what it would be like if it only said live at peace with everyone? The kind of angst, uh, I've got to please seven billion people on this planet. Listen, y'all, not everybody's going to like you. Not everybody liked Jesus. He was perfect. But this is saying, as it depends on you, don't let you be the cause of dysfunction. As far as it depends on you, have you taken the steps to reconcile? It's up to them to play ball if they want to respond. But if they don't, you can sleep good at night if you have done as far as it depends on you. It means that I can't let my sloppiness, I can't let my selfishness, I can't let my anger, I can't let uh, my lack of concern be a reason to just say, yeah, whatever. I gotta have peace in my relationships because I gotta be a peacemaker. And this is saying, as far as it depends on you, have I done everything that I can? Listen, I wanna tell you a little story and I'm gonna wrap up. Um, you know, as a pastor, I'm just being transparent. I had a conversation with another pastor in town 
And uh, we, we had, kind of had a conversation, and, and I won't give you the details. But in that conversation, I thought something in my head that was selfish and arrogant. And it basically was like this. Well, you think you can do that, but obviously God going to do something great through us. Because we're really connecting the unconnected. Aren't I awesome? So I left that meeting, and I just felt like, I didn't ever say it. Of course, I'm not that dumb. <laughs> but I thought it. Now, here's where rubber meets the road. Many of us think things like that all the time, but we don't say it. And as long as we don't say it or go public, then we're all right. We'll fly under that radar. But I was talking to my best friend, my accountability partner, and I told him, I said, man, it's weird, it's wicked, it's evil is what that is. It's just what, what on earth? And, and I, won't, I don't want to be the reason that causes a wedge between God bringing peace in somebody's life because of my selfishness. And so he said, what are you going to do about it? And I said, well, I'm going to have to meet with a guy. He's like, what? You're going to meet with him? You're going to tell him something he never knew? You didn't even express it? He had no idea. Yep. I had coffee with that guy. We met. And guess what I did? I said, hey, man, I got to tell you something that I was thinking. It's horrible. I can't even believe I thought it. But here it is. I told him. And he just laughed. And he said, I appreciate your transparency. I said, well, I'm glad you appreciate it. This is really awkward, you know. But I can't afford to be a wedge in what God's doing. Not just for others, but for my own peace of my own soul. Major deal. I want to read you this out of Matthew with the last thought. The arrival of Jesus brings peace to my soul, my relationships, and my future. Some of you are here, and you need to hear this because you're freaked out about your future. That the arrival of Jesus brings peace to your future. Some of you here, and you're, you're, you have anxiety, great angst of what the next nine, ten months are going to look like for you. Some of you are in angst of what the doctor's going to say, what your parents are going to say, what your girlfriend's going to say, what your kids are going to turn out like. Some of you are in angst, did I do the right thing with my life? Some of you are in angst of wondering, what should I do with my life? We all carry angst. But part of the arrival of Jesus to the Christmas story is that he brings peace to my future. Matthew 6 says this, Can any one of you, by worrying, add a single hour to your life? That's what Jesus said. Can you imagine if we were able to create a machine that, that antiquated hours of worry with extra hours of our life? Boy, that machine would sell really well, wouldn't it? <laughs> but this is a rhetorical question Jesus is asking. Can you, by worrying, add a single hour to your life? Nope. Nope, I pulled a few verses into one. But seek first his kingdom and his righteousness, and all these things will be given to you as well. Therefore, do not worry about tomorrow, for tomorrow will worry about itself. Each day has enough trouble of its own. He's not saying not to prepare and plan. By all means, do that. But do you have peace in your soul for your relationships and for your future? I'm going to invite the band, and, and uh, they're going to come, and they're, they're just going to... Uh, kind of give us an opportunity to reflect. And we don't always do this, but today I felt like this was a good opportunity for us just to sit and think because Advent is waiting and watching and hoping. And sometimes you need an environment where you can just wait on the Lord. Last week, Andrew spoke. Uh, we, we got, you know, canceled by Snowmageddon, you know. And, and uh, so we did online and Andrew spoke and he did a great job. And he talked about Waiting on the Lord will renew your strength. Doesn't that seem weird that you would think that you, it would be responsible of you to renew your own strength, but it's waiting on the Lord. And sometimes we need, we need to just reflect. We just need to reflect on what we hear. And so they're just going to play a song, gives you an opportunity to go ahead and grab those connection cards because every one of us in here, no matter where you are on your journey, you have a step to take in response to God's grace, especially in response to living the Advent kind of life. And maybe your step is to say, I need peace in my soul. And you know what that'll do? For all things that are our step, it really leads to this spot. To experience peace, you will have to be willing to disrupt your comfort. To experience, isn't that weird? To experience peace, you're going to have to ruffle your own feathers a little bit. <laughs> if it's peace for your soul, you're going to have to say, I've had some priorities in my life. Maybe Jesus has been out there somewhere. But I'm going to have to reprioritize and make him first. And that will cause some discomfort in your life. But it will bring eternal peace to your soul. It's amazing. If you're going to have peace in your relationships, I can tell you sitting down at coffee with somebody to tell them something nobody would have ever known. Awkward. A little uncomfortable. But that discomfort brings peace to my relationships. Maybe for some of you, you need to have coffee with somebody. 
and say, you know what I need to do is I need to say I'm sorry. It doesn't mean to not have guidelines. It doesn't mean you don't have boundaries in dysfunctional settings, but it just means as far as it depends on me, I'm going to live at peace because God brought peace to my soul. And then peace for your future. Maybe your step as you reflect today is saying, man, I have had so much angst. I feel like I'm a shepherd that's already on edge and then the angel shows up. But God wants you to know, don't be afraid. I have good news. I sent the greatest thing you would ever need. I gave you peace. If you're waiting on it, spoiler alert, you can have it. It's arrived. And you can wait on what he's done. He's met your greatest need. He's in control. It's in his hands. So as we reflect, I just want you to think through and ask God, what is my step today? What's my personal step? Like the frost on a rose Winter comes for us all Oh, how nature acquaints us With the nature of patience Like a seed in the snow I've been buried to grow for your promises, Lord, from sea to sequoia, and I know, though the winter is long, even richer, the harvest it brings. If you're the God of seasons, then I'm just in the winter. If all I know of seasons is that it's worth my patience, then if you're not done working, then God, I'm not done waiting. Because you can see my promise even in the winter. Because you're the God of greatness even in a manger. For all I know of seasons is that you take your time. Could have saved us in a second Instead you sent a child Oh, oh, oh. the winter is long Even richer The harvest it brings Though my waiting prolongs Even greater Your promise to me Like a seed 
Grew Calvary's the core.